patients. When somebody comes in and, and they, they hear the diagnosis of lung cancer and the stigma associated with it, you know, their head's down, they just know their life's over. And the thoughts are going through and I go, hey, we got this. We got this because you happen to get this scan that I can now see inside your body. And just like a weather radar, I'm seeing this tropical storm brew. We're not even at the hurricane. And I go, we've got treatments that it's a one day surgery or four days of radiation. You got a 90% chance of cure. And the best thing is you're not gonna miss work. You're not gonna be miserable. You're not gonna lose hair. So even people who maybe we don't catch it as soon, they didn't go through a lung screening program. They show up going, I feel terrible. And they have advanced stage lung cancer. Their perception or belief is my body's going to be burned up or I'm going to go through this God awful treatment. And they just, they go, I don't want to do it at all. I go, but what if I told you that the treatment's not going to make your hair fall out? And what if I told you that you're still going to be work and live life and go play golf? Mm -hmm. And what if I told you that we have, we're going to have to spend some time to do that discovery of the DNA and look for the weak points, but we've got so many discoveries along with your immune system that we may be able to keep this at point that yes, you have an advanced stage lung cancer or breast cancer, but I'm gonna bet that we can make you live out your natural life. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah. And um, this operating room is really cool. And so for for folks who don't know who you are, maybe just kind of give us uh, your position here at the hospital, what you do. And then I know you had some words about thoughts you wanted to uh the thoughts you're going to express during the podcast yeah and, and i i think the, well i'll say it however i say it but mainly it's life experiences we're all in this discovery in life and most of these are all my perspectives of how life has interacted with me and my opinions that i've formed along the way and yeah. the cool thing about life it's about discoveries and sometimes failures and yeah. um ideas you thought were correct that they weren't but that's what makes life fun and this yeah. so this is a culmination of my life experiences yeah. being in healthcare and yeah and for folks who don't know you uh could you tell us a little bit about what you do on a day-to-day basis or what your what your title is kind of give them a little background on yeah. how we got how we got here in this yeah. operating room yeah yeah so yeah it's it's really there's no one point in life that just says you're going to end up here doing a podcast in an operating right. room that you helped design i mean i don't know that anybody could predict that right. for me it's a lot of random events i didn't think were connected started out with just curiosity uh, a family who had uh, my father was a, a cardiac surgeon thoracic surgeon I mean dealing with the chest and came along in this most amazing time that i could perceive in healthcare when you took a disease like congenital heart defects people were born with abnormal hearts that was a death sentence and overcame all these challenges some of them were mental challenges philosophical challenges of should you ever touch the heart operate on the heart mm-hmm. to engineering challenges that kind of brought in my engineering degree of how do you solve taking blood out of a human body running it through a machine and putting it back in without destroying it mm-hmm. and as you know, we'll talk about later some of the hard things in life and certainly healthcare and the world we're living in today is conceptually understanding how small some of these parts of the human body are, our red cells, our platelets, our um, normal body cells. They're just something we, we have a difficult time getting our mind around and understanding the interaction that's going on at that level. Well, these guys were having to solve these kinds of problems in 1950. We're still struggling to go to the moon. We're trying to solve things. And none of this technology you're seeing in this room today was remotely possible. Mm-hmm. So that was a pretty cool and, and, and interesting time that I still wasn't both feet in on hitting to medicine. Yeah. So I had a love of aviation. I had a love of solving problems, a love of, of the engineering world, of taking a challenge and somebody saying it can't be done and going, what can? We just haven't opened our mind up enough to solving it. Mm-hmm. It truly came back to a, a entry into healthcare. And the human body is probably one of the most fascinating things that I think we have so much more to learn. So endless problem solving. That led to a uh, passion for heart, uh, heart disease tailoring on my father's footsteps, but really now coming into this world of this eureka moment of a disease like lung cancer that, holy cow, for all my career, we've always thought can't be cured. It's a death sentence, just like congenital heart disease was back in 1950, 55. 
So I'm sitting here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is my hometown, where I said I'd never come back to. Mm -hmm. Really, it probably ground zero for lung cancer. So if you have a passion for solving a problem, you've got to get where the disease is. And we're sitting in an operating room that was specifically designed uh, uh, by me and my wife to try to solve some of those challenges and how do we make things better, surgery simpler, more effective, more strategic, take out the misery. I always say in, in cancer treatments, you don't want to make the patient know they have cancer. You want to get the cancer out, do it as easily as you can. And it's just been a blend of... Yeah, so what are some examples of some things you're doing there strategically to put the patients at ease? So part of is we, uh, this is your first time in an operating room. Yeah. And to I most think, people... You know, yeah. I've had surgeries before. I don't know that I was totally yeah. uh, lucid if I have been in one. So... I can't change what genetically is happening to somebody. I can't change the fact somebody's developed lung cancer, but that experience they go through, we can change. And some of it's fear, uncertainty, is life over? What am I going to go through? And when you have time to think about something, um, sometimes that thought process can make it a lot worse than it really is. So it, it, other example, when you're in a car accident or some traumatic event, it happens so quickly, you don't have time to think about how bad it's going to hurt. So first thing was, how do we know that patient's thinking those thoughts? They're scared about their life. How do we make their entry in a room they've never seen? Something that's not as intimidating. It's not freezing cold. Um, you know, we have the ability of changing the lights, the um, uh, what's on the monitors, um, the music in the background to kind of alleviate some of that. They're staring on this table looking straight up at the ceiling, and I never thought, well, what's on that ceiling? So we started looking at well, we need to pay attention to what's up there. Right. But truly trying to alleviate that stress. And the goal is really to have them wake up and go, that was it? Mm -hmm. Did you do the surgery? And if you can take that mental um, stress away, you can take the pain of the surgery by doing robotics, all this mentally invasive surgery, use technology to my advantage and the patient's advantage, and really just focus on treating the cancer. Wow, I mean, that's a huge step that we've overcome in just the care of a patient or a disease. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit, we were looking at the monitor earlier before we started about some of the advances in technology, kind of what you're looking at. I know we were looking at uh, this lady's lungs and you were showing me some spots and talking about it, but what are, what are some of the big kind of changes you've seen over the past I don't know, five to 10 years. So, yeah. So, so most of what's, you know, great about this conversation is, you know, I don't have all the answers. This is my, my belief, my perception, my experience of what I've been through on this lifelong journey of discovery. If you go back to my college days, I was at Vanderbilt and we were working on this machine that used magnets to study the inside but to create an image off of the electromagnetic responses to cells. And it ended up being the MRI machine. Really? So okay. we're taking these goat carcasses and stu stuffing them full of different liquids and densities and materials. And guys that were way brighter than I were writing the software programming to understand how to interpret the signal and paint it a picture from that. I mean, things that just blow my mind. But that, that was, was act them actually creating the image of an MRI yeah. when you're saying paint the picture. So, yeah. So this is technology back in the 1980s. So if you look at uh, left college in 86 and you look at the advent of the home computer, the microchip iPhone. technology, the iPhone, this digital world where now some of these machines that were so expensive are now so inexpensive. Yeah. And the ability to see inside the human body, I always have felt it's important to connect with the patient, touch them, see them. But my stethoscope, my ears, my eyes can only hear and see so much. Right. And now with a three minute test with unbelievably low doses radiation i can see your heart i can see the inside chambers of your heart i can see the arteries i can see a cancer when it's developing is, it's, this, is this an mri that you're using no, this before, so what? this would yeah this would be a ct scan so yeah. traditional radiation but we're able to control and use such a low dose and have these ultra sensitive detectors that can acquire a massive amount of data within a single breath hold so you hold your breath for five seconds the machine's zapping through your body and the amount of data it's collecting is just mind-boggling what type of data is it is it the imaging that it's collecting when you're talking like when you're yeah. talking about radiation like i think of an x-ray yeah. so you're in introducing a signal into the body that's bouncing back to a detector that's processing that it's 
coming back. And, yeah, and creating this visual image of the actual anatomy inside the human body. Mm-hmm. So even in my early medical school career and residency, those scans were hard to get. It took a long time to acquire. Technology was millions of dollars. Now you're talking things that are so quick and so easy and for hundreds of thousands of dollars you can see unbelievable detail in the human body Mm -hmm. so it's allowed us to then take a disease like lung cancer where we thought man we can't cure this it's a terrible disease it's way smarter than we are it's at a level that uh, visually we can't see what's happening in these cells why is that is it is it because of all that's going on in the lungs or well, from a, they are. I know we're well, there's, that, well, there's two parts to the lung cancer that made it very um, deadly, and certainly to the southeastern part of the United States. One was that there's no symptoms. So if you were to break your ankle, you're going to call me on my phone. Right. Hey, Dr. Rob, my ankle's swollen. It hurts. I need an x-ray. Yeah. Well, the day before when you felt great, you're not calling me. You're right. doing something more fun. So you get sick. You get. You think you have the coronavirus. You have the flu. Those illnesses and the uncomfortable piece, the pain, the suffering, allow somebody to say, I'm now going to interact with the healthcare system. Right. The problem with lung cancer is you can't see or feel it. It has no symptoms. So it's growing when you have no idea. The day you're, you're having the best round of golf, you may right. have a lung cancer growing in you. The other component is if you think of how small a cancer cell is, it's about 20 microns. And putting that in perspective it's way 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 smaller than a grain of salt it's unbelievably tiny that just to get a tiny spot we can see on an imaging scan may take hundreds of thousands of cells all clumped together or even several million cells just to see a dot on a scan you could fit several million on the head of a a yeah right yeah so we we have to think we're fighting something that is unbelievably small beyond what our mind can conceptually see and we can't see its behavior like i can see you're even in a good mood today are you upset today do you have a bad day or you could examine my ankle and see where the swelling is and you could do a test to see if it's weak or so the challenge was all right how do we do this and one aspect was the human genome guys again unbelievably smart figured out how with your body the dna a single drop of blood you can find out the profile of who that person was so crime scenes investigations murders right unbelievable insight now and those tests that used to take maybe a year to perform you can do in a matter of weeks actually you can probably do it in a matter of hours right so we took that same technology and said this little cell that my human eye can't even see difficult to see even with a high-powered microscope I can now get inside that cell and use those same techniques and understand what's driving it, what's making it grow, what's making it act unruly. So that's one piece of the puzzle we how needed. How does that work from like a, like what do you mean you can see how it grows, how it acts unruly? What, what well, you're you seeing mean? what's driving it. Okay. So what is the genetic, and, and we look at the DNA, which is how, it's basically the, the brains of our human cells, what's our makeup. It's a whole bunch of proteins in sequence that that you're able through these um, next-gen sequencing, it's a type of testing, we can actually determine the protein sequence and say out of these thousands of proteins here, there's one that's out of order. That's the whole cause of why this cell went bad. Really? So now I'm able to understand why a cancer cell developed to begin with and what's making it grow. What's the driver behind that process? And is this what we, <clears throat> we kind of talked about this on the phone a couple weeks ago, is this how you're able to use genetics? And you were talking about this is specific to the Southeast to predict yeah. somebody's likelihood of actually developing something. Well, like we're not there yet, not but there it's yet, but, but it's, it's where we headed. But what we can do is take, say, you have a lung cancer, and we take your tumor cells and we'll send it through this process just like you would at a crime scene, and we can understand what's causing it to behave like it's behaving, and we can also say with this messed up DNA in this cancer cell if we give this treatment it's very susceptible to it it's very vulnerable by this attacking it this way or it shuts off what's making it grow and live so now we can be much more strategic is, about how the cancer this, is treated so this the genetic sequencing this is like um like in a DNA this is my very uh layman's yeah <laughs> uh ninth grade biology understanding but this is like is it adenine and all those like proteins yeah. that are within a DNA strand. <clears throat> yeah. And you can figure out by the way it's shaped to say, just want to make sure I'm understanding this right. Hey, 
it's acting this way because of this sequence of codes right here. You know, this protein's out of whack, and we know that a certain treatment impacts this specific type of, uh, I don't want to say mutation or malfunction or miscoding yeah. of the, the so, genes. Well, and, and, and what's so hard about the world we're in now, whether it's a coronavirus or immune system or cancer care, is you can't see it. Right. And you can't fathom how tiny it is. So I have to look at it as that DNA sequence that got messed up, whether it's because of too many cell divisions, you got old enough, there was an imperfection in how God put us together, and it starts producing this bad cell. I can figure out what got messed up in it. Mm -hmm. And going to, we're getting ready to play the Super Bowl. So if you right. have a football game and you know your opponent has a injured uh, linebacker and he's got an inexperienced person we're going to exploit that inexperienced person to try to beat the team so we're in a again talking about things you can't fathom or see mm -hmm. we know that there's a vulnerable defect to that cancer cell that if I give this drug or this treatment or I turn the immune system on this way I have a good chance of killing it mm -hmm. or stopping it from growing can you give and, an example in a way that people would understand of a medication or you said that you would get the immune system to react in a certain way so what, what yeah. would you actually be doing there like what is the medicine actually doing to the dna yeah and so our our two goals with with fighting a disease like colon cancer is understanding how small and tiny it is and being able to trust the science on understanding the dna piece of it okay. um, once you start seeing that and looking for the vulnerabilities you start looking at other ways to attack it whether it's chemotherapy drugs are more commonly today really specific drugs developed against that one defect on that cell that we know will stop it from growing or cause it to die. And, and it's a much more strategic part to it. The immune system is the other fascinating part. We always known, have known the immune system keeps us in check. It will kill a bad cell, it'll see something. But for one reason, a lot of cancers have evolved to where they're a sort of stealth against our immune system they hide for reasons we have never been able to understand. Yeah. And one of the things that's been difficult in these last couple of years with the coronavirus is understanding that healthcare and certainly the journey I've been on is a lot of discoveries and there's things in there you make mistakes, but from those mistakes or theories that you thought may be correct, you learn and you learn something you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And we have a lot of reversal of opinions where we may go down this pathway and you find out mm -hmm. all good intentions, it didn't work. We're just playing that out publicly with the coronavirus. In the cancer world, you know, what we spent so many years knowing the immune system could kill a cancer cell, but all the treatments weren't working. We had one thing wrong. One, one um, uh, scientific theory or, or discovery that, that was incorrect. It's like having a, a decimal point in the wrong place. So there's a couple guys, and one of them was a guy from Texas, Jim Allison, and there's a great documentary called Jim Allison. Um, uh, it's just all centered around the, uh, the discovery of, of this whole classification of immune therapy treating cancer. And what he did was found the mistake and said, all these brilliant guys made one simple mistake. They're wrong. And then he had to convince the scientific world that they were all were wrong about something they were passionate about. I'm which I'm sure they were all willing to admit right off the bat. Well, it's tough because <laughs> we, we get we dig into our beliefs, and it takes a while for us to, to stand back, and that's part of being a good physician or scientist to go, you know what, I was wrong about that. After proving it, then he had to get the, the companies to get behind. Here's how we should have been doing it. So what we realize is that if there's a for a simple term, a light switch that is keeping us in the dark. I'm a white blood cell and you're a cancer cell and I have the ability of killing you, but I can't see you. All these drugs are doing is flipping that switch on where I go, wait a minute, you're, allowing, you're right there. So you're, what you're saying is you're allowing the immune system to do its job. Yeah. The drug is turning the light switch on. And, and things that we're seeing now, certainly in the lung cancer world, we've seen it in melanoma. Um, it's now extending other tumors I've never seen in my life. But it was a period of 20 years of, of correcting the literature, um, rediscovering and working on things. But now we have from understanding things you can't see, the DNA, the um, stuff that's beyond what the mind can even fathom, how small you're working, to now understanding ways of 
manipulating our immune system to do the job of killing the cancer cell or taking a specific drug and going after that cancer cell. And one other conceptual thing that we've had to change in my life of treating cancers has been maybe I don't get rid of every cancer cell. You know, right. we probably caused a lot of harm with the thought I had to blow up, you know, set, detonate a nuclear bomb and destroy every cancer cell. Do you not, um, and again, I don't know that much about cancer, but is it, uh, I guess, was the thought there that if you didn't kill everyone, you're more likely, to, they're more likely to metastasize? And well, they're going to keep coming back and you keep fighting this fight that you'll eventually lose. So what would be the advantage to not killing every cancer cell? Well, if you can't feel it, so if we go back to lung cancer, the model that I'm passionate about, um, if you don't know it's there, and I can, through these different discoveries, be able to stop that cell from growing, and it just became lazy and just sat there. Okay. And you lived out your natural so life. Like small enough, Maybe not, the, not to make like a comparison here to like HIV, but some of these people who, like say Magic Johnson, who's... HIV levels are so low, right, that he's basically able to live his life so you turn, if he didn't have it. So ab, like it well, true, and, and, and the HIV era turned us into some of those ideas, and breast cancer discovery started doing the same thing, going, maybe if it's not bothering you, and I can keep those cells in hibernation, or I can shut off what's making them grow, and they're you have... They're not impacting any of... They're not affecting your daily life, then that's a cancer win. That's a cancer survivor. You know, it may be that... 15 years later you die of a heart attack or whatever natural cause would have done it you know i would consider that today a cancer cure oh, yeah. even though you may still be walking around with cancer cells in you but if you have no idea they're there maybe we don't need to go to the extent of destroying the human body and the tissue around it and yeah. causing disabilities Chemo chemotherapy and some of the treatments today are pretty uh ravenous on the body right well i would say they used to be they used to be my the the best thing that you you know, as a physician, which tells me we're making progress, when somebody comes in and, and they, they hear the diagnosis of lung cancer and the stigma associated with it, you know, their head's down, they just know their life's over. And the thoughts are going through, and I go, hey, wait, we got this. We got this because you happen to get this scan that I can now see inside your body. And just like a weather radar, I'm seeing this tropical storm brew. We're not even at the hurricane. And I go, we've got treatments that it's a one-day surgery or four days of radiation you got a 90% chance of cure. And the good. best thing is you're not going to miss work. You're not going to be miserable. You're not going to lose hair. Right. Or even it's people that are, yeah. Not, so, yeah. So even people who maybe we don't catch it as soon, or they didn't go through a lung screening program, they show up going, I feel terrible, and they have advanced stage lung cancer. Their perception or belief is my body's going to be burned up or I'm going to go through this god-awful yeah, treatment. Die at the end of it. Yeah. And they just, they go, I don't want to do it at all. And I go, well, what if I told you that, the treatment's not going to make your hair fall out. And what if I told you that you're still going to be work and live life and go play golf? Mm -hmm. And what if I told you that we have, we're going to have to spend some time to do that discovery of the DNA and look for the weak points, but we've got so many discoveries along with your immune system that we may be able to keep this at point that yes, you have an advanced stage of lung cancer or breast cancer, but I'm going to bet that we can make you live out your natural life. And you just see that their eyes open up and go, so wow. what is step one? You, they come in, they get a scan, you see cancerous cells in their lungs. What is step one? Is it, or I guess you send in a biopsy to confirm it's cancer. Right. What's the next step in terms of sequencing the DNA and kind of figuring that out? What's the time frame? So the whole key is getting enough material from that tumor to be able to run all those tests on. Okay. And it doesn't take a lot, just like a crime scene. You just need a, a, a piece of blood, a piece of the, the victims, uh, the the whoever created the crime or caused the crimes DNA left behind on the shirt or something. Mm -hmm. We need a little bit more than that in the cancer world. Right. So now that we're seeing these tumors really tiny, we also had to technologically come up with techniques that could get to tiny little spots and get us that tissue. Yeah. So once again, from an engineering world and for anybody interested in healthcare, cool gadgets where right. you can robotically go into a body a person's lungs and navigate through using kind of like a gps and this is in a surgery yeah so it's in a room similar to this mm -hmm. um, the patient's asleep so they're not feeling anything they're able to navigate out into the lung tissue and get and guide a needle into something that's really tiny and get tissue back through that long process of how they got there and they're using all types of 
imaging to, to precisely, it's kind of like docking a, the SpaceX rocket at the space at the space station where you're you're doing fine adjustments getting it in there and you have a pathologist who's looking at it in real time as you're getting tissue out and saying you got it you've got enough tissue here's where we are that then starts the game the process of all right how do I now get to what I need to know which is what's driving that cancer cell to 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 multiply and divide that's when we start looking at sending off and and really trying who's to outsmart who's doing the who's like looking at that sequencing and figuring all that out so it's a a a whole field that's exploding okay. so if you look at um again the world we've been in the last couple of years with pcr testing basically it's a way of looking at a virus has rna as opposed to dna which is in our human cells if you look at those same protein sequences and and again you know, this picture labels it to be this virus that type of same technology done in a little bit different way is how we're we're utilizing the taking a piece of tissue or a small sample of a biopsy and running it through that technology called next gen sequencing and giving us a printout of all of the information about that cancer cells dna not your normal cells there's a lot of companies that have been involved in it but we even have here in Chattanooga a local lab that's been able to purchase the technology. And you're starting to able to see from where it was a few places around the country to more places right. to then even communities like Chattanooga that can bring that kind of technology in. And it, it's a whole new field of there's more we don't know than we know. And as you start running all these tests, you may see this repetitive pattern of something you've not seen before. And you go, all right, here's something we can now target. And you start working in the lab to exploit what that vulnerability is and developing medicines and therapeutics that... Is this more on a mass scale than like a single patient, like when you're talking about developing of therapeutics? Yeah. yeah. So, so one of the most important things in healthcare is teamwork. Yeah. yeah so sharing of data, labs looking at specimens, collecting uh, masses amounts of information and pooling that and using machine learning, artificial intelligence to start guiding you on where to go. Mm -hmm. I said, the hardest thing for me is I can't see any of this stuff. I can't see a virus, can't see a cancer cell, right. and much less I can't see the protein sequence, the DNA in it. So you're having to just, you're blown away by the technology of what you can do, and that, that right. technology puts it in a format on a piece of paper. I go, now I can see, at least on paper, what's making up that cancer cell and start strategizing with the team players of how we're going to shut off the fuel line to it. Just if you're trying to outsmart an army or military remove, the right. biggest thing to do is shut off their food and fuel and gas supplies and you starve them. Right. So if we can starve that cancer cell and shut off what it is, right. maybe not set off that nuclear bomb, well, that, that's, a, that's a totally new strategy of, yeah. of fighting cancer that's much more exciting to yeah. the patient and obviously us. Now, if I'm a patient, and I've had this, my tissue sampled, what you were talking about, where they go in and take the tissue and send it off. What am I kind of doing in the interim before we're kind of figuring out the treatment path? So part of the team that's really important is we have navigators, we have a lot of other people, but communicating with that patient. Yeah. So honestly, you're still in a uh, stress level of 10. Your life's flashing before you, all the good and bad things you've done, you, you know, what your current situation is, do you have kids, you know, your spouse. There's so much that, that I think is natural. Our job is really to say, here's the plan. And I borrowed this from a Minnesota Gopher football coach and took my own twist on it, but we've got to start rowing the boat. It's so easy just to go home and sit there and literally just be depressed and go, ah, this, I guess this is how it's going to end. My job is to say, nope, we've got all these options. We're going to start rowing the boat. And step one is to get tissue. How do we get tissue? Well, I can do it two weeks from today or I can do it tomorrow. The quicker you can move somebody through the process, it gets them going to the solution. It and when you mind kind of is yeah. geared in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. And when you then start getting and giving them a true plan and say, this is beatable. And it's not what you used to think it was or what you saw your grandfather go through. Then you get them into the fighting mode. So communication being very um, uh, coordinated in your, uh, I say, attack of how we, uh, um, what we put the patient through, being very uh, mindful that time is a minute to them is maybe a month to me. Right. Uh, 
and and so they're they're on a different where their life is truly at, at on hold right. so half of cancer care is is what's in the operating room and alleviating that pain to how quick we can get them through it how quick we can get them to a solution and you'll see that sort of relief come off their face we'll pair them up with we have a a, a support group but it's both advocacy and support of people who've gone through it and they may have emotional phrases that help them through it it's called the second wind society and we will connect them to other people that again they may not be able to go home and talk to their friend who's never had cancer whose life's not really on the line but you can get to these people and go yeah i was that way here's what i did to get over that and here's how i did to get up off the couch and here's what i did this is what i kept repeating and here's a scripture or a saying and and you try to really bring that community together Right. And then when they do survive and they get through all of it, you get them to tell their story. You get them to go to Washington. You get them to go to, um, uh, uh, you know, sporting events. Um, you get them to go places and you get them to talk about it. And half of getting through from the dark side where we are to where we are now is just education and communication and talking and changing that perception of a disease like lung cancer mm-hmm. isn't always associated with smoking. And it's certainly not associated yeah. with a you have to die from it. That's what uh, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, you kind of mentioned to me earlier that I just always thought if you got lung can- like the only people that got lung cancer were smokers, which is not true. No. Is it um, are there things that you can do? I know you mentioned some of its genetics, so uh, which is yeah. what we've been talking about, I guess, but are there things you can do from a day to day, I mean obviously outside of don't don't smoke. Um things that you can do to reduce your risk of getting lung cancer? Yeah. So there's, I always put in two categories. Okay. Certainly the DNA that your body's made up with has a lot to do with what's going to happen in your life. But there's also a second component and it's sort of chronic inflammation that helps mess up that DNA mm-hmm. or aggravate it. And for, for me, if you go back to a simple solution, my sister may have a bruise on her leg, and the more I hit it and punched it, the more she yelled and screamed, and I could elicit a reaction to, from her. Mm-hmm. So if we have DNA that's fragile and it's on your skin cells and you're in the sun working in the farm all day or you're out fishing in the ocean all day or you're just out in the beach or sun and not using any protection, that repetitive inflammation, the sunburn, will lead to expediting the damage of that cell or vulnerability of it and turning it into a cancer cell when you say turning it into a cancer cell is that it is it causing mutations in the splitting yeah. of the cells right so our, your skin cells may live or change over every every week mm-hmm. so when it's doing that each time it it reproduces a new cell and the old cell dies there's an opportunity for things to get messed up well if your skin's burnt and inflamed then that likelihood of having a bad cell produced becomes higher so what happens in tobacco in our lungs chronic inflammation first time anybody took a puff off a cigarette they probably coughed it felt like their throat was burning i know in college the first time i drank jack daniels i thought my esophagus was going to melt <laughs> but you get used to it and yeah. you don't realize that that chronic inflammation is just going all day continuously and over many decades there are people who are vulnerable to that who are going to develop lung cancer what we got it wrong is we made it about if you smoke you're a bad person and you get lung cancer the reality of most smokers will get emphysema, they'll have heart disease, they'll die of a heart attack. Yeah. The minority will actually get lung cancer. Really? And but if you take 150 million people, which is half the country, have lot. smoked, mm-hmm. and say two percent of them will get lung cancer, that's still a lot of people. But the majority of them will never get lung cancer. They'll get other health issues from it. And so, we really have tried to change the messaging of. The only requirement to get lung cancer is that you have lungs. And you really have to look past just the smoking. It's become um, a a judgmental issue of you're a bad person because you smoked. Mm -hmm. Uh, And really look at the genetics, your family history. Um, Our biggest group getting lung cancer that's on the rise is women non-smokers. Really? Women non-smokers with an Asian ancestry. And it's a different kind of cancer. But that's purely genetic. Yeah. And, yeah. and and we're going to get to where we can discover that. But right now it's sort of how do you profile who's most at risk, which then leads to the other topic. And we had mentioned this earlier. 
someday there'll be a test that's going to tell you, just like the BRCA gene for breast cancer, that you're likely to get lung cancer at some point in your life. You may have never been a smoker, you may be a vegan, you exercise, your body fat's low, you're doing everything right in life, but there's still this genetic piece you can't overlook. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that 90% certainty you're going to develop at some point lung cancer. What I can't tell you is that I'm not 100% certain, and I can't tell you that what time that's going to occur. Right. So maybe it's at age 80, and in, in the way life has it, at age 50, you're in a plane crash and you die. And I, swore, I told you this information that maybe altered your thinking in life, how you dealt with life, and how much do people want to know that. And that's where the science is hitting. And I always have this ethical mm -hmm. pause of, gosh, I don't know. We're certainly not ready for any of that information today. <laughs> At some point in my lifetime, it'll be here. By ready, you mean we don't have the data to make those predictions? Well, I think yet, we're, we're, heading we're getting closer but none of these tests are 100%. And none of these tests are going to say what your life's really going to be like and when it would happen. And, and how would I alter your life psychologically, emotionally, the thought of whether you had kids or not? You may be passing on this gene, and do I want to pass this gene on? Yeah. How much are we now changing the world and human interactions on a piece of data that's not 100% and doesn't also take into account the other things in life, a car accident, a freak boating accident that... Well, not to mention you said you don't... You, there's a good chance you die from something totally different before that ever happens. Well, there is a chance, so... And then... And there's take, a chance that it doesn't... You don't ever develop it at all. Take the other piece of it is just because you may develop that lung cancer that I could predict through this genetic testing, it doesn't mean you can't treat it. Right. So, I don't know, there's so much that we have to walk carefully as we're going through these periods of discovery and yeah. I think as a as human beings and talking through it make sure we don't the science doesn't get ahead of where we're emotionally at and what we really should know and want to know you got to think though in the grand scheme of things we'd rather be in the place where we could predict that and and tell people I guess uh rather than just you know 50 years Man, ago I, well, I, I think or, that's or, the question for your audience um yeah I, I have mixed views. I don't know how much I would really want to know because I, I don't know how it would affect my day-to-day -day interactions. Yeah. More importantly right now, what I tell people, I go, those who are at risk, who may not know they're at risk or understand what their true risk of lung cancer is, we've got this huge amount of talent and discovery that's going on that um, if you were to develop it, man, your odds are so much better than they were 10 years ago. Yeah. if you were developed it and that's the easy thing keep that moving forward and as the other science of predicting who might get a disease or a cancer you know there's got to be a lot more thought of how far do we go in that world yeah and how we use it. it boils down to too um this is kind of what you're saying are the impact that that knowledge will have on your life i think uh dictates the appropriateness of knowing it right yeah like you were saying, if we could get to a point where it's not a big deal to get lung cancer and you know that you can pretty much be cured with relative certainty and it's, it's not this big ordeal to go through, well, then maybe people do want to know. So I think you have that's – the, that's where I come back to. You just hit on the solution. We have to give them the solution ahead of telling them and that there is a good solution instead right. of saying that – um, you're going to get this disease that we're not sure whether you'd live or die or what the treatment's going to be or how successful that is. Yeah. I think the two really have to probably go together. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to circle back. I don't know if we hit it fully, <clears throat> but I, it sounds like there's things I can avoid doing. And then there's genetic factors. So yeah. I, I can avoid smoking. I can avoid certain things. There's genetic factors that, you know, luck of the draw. Are there things like, does diet help? Does exercise help? Are there things you're seeing, you know, from a holistic uh, view that pay, that people can do in their everyday lives yeah. that might reduce their risk of? So there's two things I try to, and this is, again, all of these, my views are me living life not correctly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> discovering gravity, experimenting, trying to get discovering away with gravity. things from yeah. my parents, sneak a beer. Right. You know, when you're underage, probably the biggest lesson I've learned looking back at age 57 is there is a critical point in our development that's part of the conversation world today. So up until about age 25, 26, the brain's still developing. Yeah. A lost month, <laughs> a lost 
year, I lost whether stimulating that brain, educating the brain, but also not subjecting it to chemicals, to drugs, things that are altering it. Because when you do, whether it's anesthesia in the operating room at age six, or whether it's smoking marijuana every day, I take it away from judgmental whether that's good or bad to do it. I just go, you're changing your brain chemistry. As it's growing. As your brain is developing and growing. And we know strongly that you are left with a lifelong anchor baggage that you're carrying with it. Nicotine, anything that's making your mind feel happy, sad, incredibly stimulated, all of those things are changing your dopamine, your serotonin, those cells that you need to feel normal. How is that impacting something like cancer though? Or is, so, it, or is that different? So it's different. Okay. So where I say that early years of, of, I say it's different. The, the brain and chemicals and stimulants are one piece of it. So I always try to say, you know, just hold off. Wait till your brain's developed. If you wait on the surgery and anesthesia, if you can um, protect that piece of it. From a body standpoint, inflammation and damage to the cells, the foods we're eating. Again, I have not eaten a great diet, but we know sugar in the dextran molecule is a great inflammatory marker yeah. in the body. Uh, we know a lot of processed meats and foods, which I've eaten a ton of, you know, cause this inflammatory, the gluten and so many other things that are well beyond that, that, that start this process that takes many decades. But if you're starting it young in life and you're continuing those habits for 30 or 40 years, we now see why at age 40 or 50 or 60, um, these things are developing. And some of it is you're vulnerable to it, but also it's that chronic repetition of inflammation that's changing your cells, changing how your body ages, changing how your mind functions. Uh, it's hard to tell that to a teenager to, hey, be careful because you're, you don't, you're, you're, you're a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> you're discovering gravity. You're breaking bones. You're, mm -hmm. you're learning why your parents told you not to do that. And that's part of growing up. But I think we have to, when we look at, at whether it's education and the brain and what's going on in schools and keeping the kids in that developmental stage is so critical, but also looking at, at the foods we're eating. I always go back to challenge somebody to take a picture of Woodstock and find a fat person there. There's yeah. not one. I mean, you can take any concert venue outdoor and you can find yeah. most people overweight. So there's clearly things we've done that haven't been helpful to how we age. Do I enjoy eating all this stuff? Sure I have, but I've also learned as I've gotten older, I can feel better if I avoid some of them. And feeling better is so much more powerful. I've noticed that when I cut out carbs, sugar, I feel so much better. And you know, it's the thing kind of like you were saying, you do, you do this stuff every day. It's like when you start cutting that stuff out, you're like, oh, I didn't realize I was so tired all the time or lethargic, right? Yeah. Or, so it's driving you then have to have some stimulant, whether it's a, a triple shot of, of espresso or something to keep you going and or yeah. people that are using the nicotine the vaping electronic cigarettes you're doing it because you feel terrible mm -hmm. when you actually are are missing the bigger picture of of sometimes it's what we're putting in our body and you know i again i try not to to lecture to people i, I use my life experiences of everybody's seen how i've eaten growing up i played football i was the the big meat eater and i go i still like it man, I feel better when I'm eating a different kind of diet. My, my attitude, my, uh, my joints, my fingers. Like a lower, like more vegetables, more greens. And, and I don't, I'm going to get crucified for this, but it's, it's more towards a vegan diet, yeah. plant-based diet. And, and I didn't, one, I didn't think I could enjoy it or sustain on it. But what I found is, is, you know, operating, we're using fine movements with our fingers, even with robotics or suturing and certainly in heart surgeries, very precise movements. So you age, you start getting arthritis, stiffness in your joints. Yeah. And just by simply 30 minutes of some exercise, it doesn't have to be training for an Ironman, mm -hmm. but continuous activity lowers your inflammatory component, helps your immune system. It's, it's a proactive thing as far as cell damage and, and trying to, to prevent cancer. But also combining that with a nutritional plan that focuses on cutting down that inflammation, mm -hmm. which is, I think, a big driver to chronic diseases and how bad we feel. Is it now when you talk about meat, is it the meat causing inflammation, or when you talk about processed meats? I know you're not a nutritionist, but 
because I, I, I know the sugar's bad. I know carbs are bad for inflammation. Vegetables seem to be good. So if you, if you look at what the food, and I'll, I'll speak at it more generic because I'm certainly not a nutritionist, yeah. <laughs> but, but you look at how our stomach and the lining of our stomach and how much bacteria, yeah, yeah, all that that's, that's interacting, again, we can't see it. So it's always hard for us to put our finger on it. But you can take somebody who has a disease where the body's attacking themselves, and you can look at their gut and their gut mucosa, and you can see where somebody's eating things are pro-inflammatory. Mm-hmm. And take probably the most overused topic is gluten, whether gluten sensitive or truly have a celiac disease. You'll see this chronic inflammation in your gut. Right. And that drives so many other health issues that hard for people because of I just like eating this and they also can't see that you can't take your intestine out and open it up and show them what it looks like Um, it's hard to get them to buy into it but I always give them there's a a simple five-day challenge and I won't name the company names I'm not not trying to promote it but it's it's always uh what was done to me and my wife and they go it's five days you tell me all the stuff you've done in your life you can't do this for five days so I go okay and it's a it's a sort of a mimicking of a fasting diet. Um, it's using plant-based food. What you find is by day three, okay, I'm hungry. You start realizing how much junk you put in your body you don't, you don't take account or measure of. By day four and five, you don't need the coffee. You're feeling euphoric. You yeah. accomplish something. Day six, they let you go back and eat wherever you want. Day six, you feel like you've been on an all-night binge drinking. And you go back and eat that. And you go, oh, I feel hungover, only I didn't drink. Yeah. And you start, most of us are common sense, intelligent people. You know, we don't, why is it right? And you, you start putting two and two together. And certainly as you get older, you go, I want to feel good. I want to wake up. I want to have a full day. I want to interact with my family, my kids. I want to go skiing. I want to go running. I want to do whatever. Mm-hmm. And you start putting that, that, um, say a self discovery information together of, yeah, it does matter what I eat. And, and I, I haven't had anybody who's gone through that process who doesn't agree. It's still a battle, and it's a yeah. challenge to... Do you fast? So I, I intermittent fast. That's what I do, yeah. What do you and, do, and like I would have 16-hour windows, or do you do... I'm always curious to see how people kind of set up their protocol. So here's what's, what's interesting about all that, and, and I go back to this coronavirus world we've been in. Mm-hmm. It's played out in the public... Uh, domain, social media, the news networks. Part of medicine is we don't know the answers. And a novel virus is we don't know anything about it. So there's lots of opinions, beliefs, and discovery. In the medical world, we use peer-reviewed studies. And there's a lot of what we call reversal of opinions that I would have bet this would have been true. And in the discovery process, you go, "Ah, it wasn't true. So fasting was one of those things a long time ago that we were taught it's terrible for the body. Right. You actually breakfast, hold on right. to yeah. Breakfast. Yeah, I, I was not getting out the door without my mother feeding me breakfast, whether right. I wanted it or not. Most I important meal of the day. Yeah. Then here we are today, going maybe not. And if I don't eat until noontime, and then I stop eating at six o'clock, well, that's not that hard. Holy cow! Even at age fifty-seven, you start going, man, my weight's going down. Mm-hmm. When I th- was told or thought I couldn't lose weight, I was always told too, like you gotta eat before you exercise, and like now I'll get up and work out in the mornings. I haven't eaten since you know six thirty-seven the night before, and then I still yeah. won't eat till one thirty in the afternoon. I don't even think about it. Um, it took a couple of weeks to get there, but I do so the, feel a lot better. And I like that feeling of being actually hungry. Yeah. Right. Where you're, if you're just eating all the time, I remember I used to eat five small meals a day. And I look back and I'm like, how did I do that? So we've we've taken a this this uh, uh, curious path of from cancer and viruses and this inflammation. You know, part of it is the discovery. We don't know everything about the human body, which is great because it leaves so much more to learn. And there's always there's always somebody who has to challenge the accepted norm, whether it was how the immune system interacts and works against cancer, that we had something wrong. To nutrition, the food pyramid was the gold standard until when I was at the Mayo Clinic, you know, we started challenging nutritionists because I go, show me the data. I'm a data guy. Well, there wasn't much data. And I said, now it seems political. You just want me to eat it because you want me to eat it. And, and we were in the parallel world with um, heart surgery. You can imagine if you're on one floor of the Mayo Clinic, you got served 
no sugar. It was all meat. It was vegetables. And then you walk down to the heart surgery floor and you were served yogurt and you were served all these high carbohydrate foods, but no fat. Mm -hmm. And then we had the guys in the lab going, Hey, it's not fat. It's It's actually sugar. sugar. And we had to, we had to change our whole thought and it took a long time to get our arms around it. And fasting was one of those where the, the data is now coming back into, we were misled or the perceptions or lack of true studies put behind it that there's, there's probably some something to stories it. stories too about the, um, and I don't know the full details behind it, but the sugar com- companies who were <laughs> selling <laughs> the high sugar foods, I think were involved in a lot of those studies that kind of came out with the food pyramid and stuff. So it's interesting. Uh, well, it's I, I, would, I would go and I'd try to not always dive in the conspiracy mode. Yeah, Although I certainly, I'm not a big conspiracy guy. But... Yeah. Part of capitalism is giving people what they want. If you're trying to sell a product, you got to make sure that people want it. And, mm-hmm. you know, Frosted Flakes, man, Pretty who didn't? Good. Tony the Tiger. <laughs> I mean, it tasted good. Mm-hmm. But but you didn't realize, and our knowledge of the human body at that time didn't understand what we were really doing. Yeah. And then you also couldn't believe you could be happy without drinking 12 cups of coffee and eating all the sugar and the sweets until you really start changing it and getting through that changeover period and going wow I actually feel better and I don't even want the coffee and I'm not craving the dessert and yeah. my fingers don't swell and my joints don't ache and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm happier about life and yeah I enjoyed frosted flakes and 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 desserts and things like that but maybe I don't miss them that much yeah so I'll, I want to circle back a little bit you were talking about um, so much of science's discovery can we talk a little bit about, I know you have this bus that you have yeah. where you do a lot of advanced lung screenings. Maybe talk about that and then the importance of catching these things early, right? Getting people in there and studying them over the years. Like I know yeah. my mom said she came in and did her screening, you know, and she's got like a something in her lung that you guys have been watching. Yeah. It's not a big deal, but it's like there every year. And she's just talking about how interesting it is to kind of, have that annual check-in and you're updating these images so a couple explain what the that whole thing yeah there's bus a, is and then yeah a couple of things that all came into that and again none of these are just you wake up one day and that's it it's right. just a lot of interacting with life talking discovery of information in the lung cancer world we knew we could now look at things we can't see with our eye in a microscope meaning the genetics what's driving that cell to multiply and divide and that whole technology was taking off. The other component was we have to find the lung cancer before somebody knows they have it. Well, if there's no symptoms, how do you do that? And I go back to, I don't want to go to the doctor myself. I don't, I'm not right. fond of medical centers and hospitals and doctors, so I avoid them like everybody else does. On the side that you're on, right? Unless yeah. if I feel like crap. Mm-hmm. So if there's not that marker driving it, what can we do in this computer world where we have electronic health records and we have this machine learning process and I say natural language processing, it's a type of software like Alexa and Siri use mm-hmm. that, that they can understand what my intent is. And I can take this software, there's a company that we utilize called Think Health, where we can go through the hospital electronic records. There may be 300,000 charts sitting below us in a basement on a server. They're all ones and zeros. I can't read them, <clears throat> but what if I took a software that was, <clears throat> excuse me, that was just like Alexa and Siri use <clears throat> and say, I want you to go find out of those 300,000 people <clears throat> who have a smoking history, whose family had cancer in it genetically, um, who would be as best we can predict today <clears throat> likely to develop lung cancer and then tell me where they live tell me who their doctor is and then let me proactively go after that patient and try to educate them and engage them into a screening program so what we found is that we could take a population of a half a million and say you know what there's really about 30,000 who are truly at risk for this disease I can leave the 470,000 alone but then how do I engage 30,000 people into a screening program mm-hmm. well first I have to make it easy convenient simple I have to tell them and educate them in a way, cheap. Um, So for years, we would sit back in our office and think that if we sent a message to them, they would just knock on my door and say, hey, I want that scan. 
Nope. No, because you're scared. Yeah. You, you don't really want to know what's going on inside your body. I feel good. I can't be. I'm going to go play you're golf today. Head in the sand, Tomorrow. Right? I'll, yeah, that's how we've worked. So I realized that I had to go to the patients. So part of it was that concept, let's take me and the technology to them. Simple enough. It's not unique in mobile healthcare, yeah. except nobody ever built this. And that machine that develops these pictures we're seeing on the scan is complicated. It has to be level. It has to be humidity and temperature controlled. It was never designed to go bumping down highways and climbing hills. And the platform of how you're delivering it, it wasn't really tested. So we got a couple of generous donors and said, you know, let's try to do better. Let's come up with a concept and deal with a prototype, just like you would with a car or a new vehicle, and see if it's even feasible. Does the technology hold up? So we went through that process, drove it for three years, and found a couple of things. One, if you make healthcare simple, easy, and cheap, people engage in it. If you give them a good reason and value of what you're doing. So it wasn't just that I'm going to find lung cancer. It's that I'm going to tell you how you're aging. It's like lifting the hood of the car. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try to start giving you things, one or two or three things that will keep you away from doctors and hospitals what and healthier. What example of that be when you say I'm going to tell you how you're aging? So, you so in our population, if you take the people who are at risk that we're screening over the age of 50, have a smoking history, family history of cancer, they're probably more likely at risk for dying of a heart attack than of the lung cancer. So what do we see on this test? We see the heart, the coronary arteries. And I can now use that software from the machine to say, you have this much plaque buildup in your arteries, you're at risk of having a heart attack in the next five years. Or you know what, genetically you're blessed, you don't have anything going on, you don't need to be on these medications. Mm -hmm. You can look at their bone density, there's things you see, their kidneys, their liver, their pancreas, their gallbladder, all the things are that you this, can't feel. Are these all the CT scans yeah. you're referring to? Yeah, so all this data is on the scan, and even though we're just looking at the lungs primarily, from the validation of why doing this, the rest is all sitting there. So why not use it? Mm -hmm. So now you're you're able to take the technology of the patient. And do this it. is actually like in a a bus. Yeah. Okay. So Are it's you, a. Is it driving around like? So it's driving around. We we first took a Winnebago shell and put in and, and retro engineered a machine to go in there and did all the the testing on it, lead lined it, and. Um, drove it for three years. We realized we made a bunch of mistakes in the chassis, the weight capacity of what it was doing, the H HVAC system needed to be more robust. Then went back to the drawing board and and designed what is now a commercially available bus that has about a 10-year technology shelf life. Yeah. It's durable. It can go up small country roads, mountains, hills, deliver the technology, but it's also now connected back to the hospital. So if you walk into the, we're at a Hardee's in a small town that doesn't have a hospital. So you're just dri like, you just drive to it. Like, how do you tell people you're coming? I don't want to like yeah. get too far off base because it's super interesting. But like, well, you, 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 it's it's not like this. It's not like the circus like coming to town. You you go to a, a employer in that community or a okay. service group or a church, mm -hmm. or you go to the Walmart or the grocery store or the, you know Piggly Wiggly in the South or Publix now, to um, um, a a, uh, so a a local leader of that community and say, here's the data on your community. Here's what we're trying to do. We want to make people live longer. We want to improve the health, which strengthens their mm -hmm. uh, employment for the companies, for whatever industries in the town. You know, certainly nobody's Tennessee, unfortunately, is in number five in the worst uh, life expectancy. And part of it's because of our lung cancer problem and heart disease issues. Mm -hmm. So if you go in and say, I'm going to do this, it's going to be simple. Um, we're going to make it uh, not disruptive, and I'm going to give your people real things to work on, not a lab number, but a picture and show them what's happening in their body and give them some things, and we'll come back each year and keep watching and watching how they're aging. And when you find stuff, here's the pathway of how we're going to handle it. Um, you now have a much better opportunity of engaging somebody in their health. I go to my wife's small town in Mississippi, Corinth, Mississippi, and I go to the little liars table where they have breakfast. Yeah. Those same people that I've always been told in healthcare on a suicide mission, they don't care. They're, they're smoking and drinking and eating terrible food because they just don't care about life. No, they want to live. We've made healthcare too difficult, um, too complicated. The words, how we presented the information that they walk away confused from the doctor's visit. Mm -hmm. They don't know really where to start. And so it becomes too harsh. They just don't do anything. 
Right. But if I can take somebody and say we're sitting at the a church or a Hardee's and I talk with them about it and I go, so it's three minutes, hop on the bus. I'm going to show you the insides That's of it, your bodies three minutes. to do the scan. Yeah. It, ten, 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 talking about earlier yeah. You hold your breath and a simple breath hold. Boom. You're, you acquire these images that are, will give you the details. And then are you, um, I don't know what the right word is. Are you assessing those images or looking at them? So right we have there? the ability of two things. I'll be at some events where you're there um, on site and you'll go down, which is the the, the most um, satisfying part of a career. You're actually sitting with somebody kind of like the old Doc Hollywood in this small town and you're going, I know you don't understand cholesterol levels, but here's what I can show you. These are the arteries keeping your heart alive and they're full of junk. And here's what we need to do to help lessen your risk of a heart attack. Or here's what I'm seeing from your bone structure. Or here's what's happening in your liver. And here's what's happening in other things. And uh, by the way, here's what your lungs look like, which are so important, particularly in today's world of all these viruses that attack it. How do we keep you healthy and, and, and lower your risk of dying from one of those illnesses? They can see that picture and you give them one or two or three things to do. Much more effective and keeping it simple and likely they're going to do it than how we've traditionally done medicine. So we found that the bus was something that could be built. We've overcame some of the engineering challenges. Right. We know that it's um, once it's a hospital or a foundation or donor invests and starts it up, it's self-sustaining, so it doesn't require continued funding to make it work. We know that people in these rural communities embrace it. They, yeah. they don't want to die. They just want help knowing how to live. And so it's an opportunity of changing healthcare delivery only we need more than one bus. Yeah. Is it just one right now? Well, we're getting ready to build our second one. Okay. So, and the idea is to start replicating this in the southeastern region. Not that any one hospital owns it, but we divide all the counties up, and we all stay within our hula hoop of if I find something in a patient that's three hours away, they don't want to come to my medical center. Right. Let's pair them up with who's closest to them. And I How think far it's... How you generally try? Like, what's the... the we'll the try to keep is. it to about an hour and a half. If I, get, yeah. if I get further than that, then that distance, if we were to find something or that patient and need. The issue for them to get treatment. Yeah. yeah. And the cool thing is what's happening in the lung cancer world. Discovering all these DNA things that you can't see that blow my mind away. We understand that if we're, we catch the disease early when there's no symptoms, we can cure it likely. And now we know who and where and how to go after the disease and make healthcare unbelievably simple instead of waiting back in my office with my white coat on for, for somebody to knock on the door and tell me they're in, in trouble. Coughing up blood. Yeah, so much more satisfying. And then if I can take him through, okay, and we do find, we'll find lung cancer yeah, in somebody. Say, do you have patients where you, do you tell them yeah. right there? What's the yeah, well, thing? you know, you'll say, hey, we found something, but here's the thing. And, and this was what was happening in my office today before you showed up. I go, a guy who's been getting lung screening was in his third year of doing it. A new little nodule popped up. And I go, here's the great thing. It is cancer, but I go, it's so tiny. Um, we're going to put you through four treatments of radiation. You're not going to miss lunch, breakfast, or dinner. You're not going to take time off from work. It's you got so a great incredible. chance of cure. It's not going to affect your breathing. You don't keep going. But because of what we know now and how he engaged and how we... Because that was because he kept coming in, right? Yeah. yeah. And how we, instead of making you come to me for health care, I'm coming to you. And I, I have to understand it's your time is important, more important than even my time. And if I take that perspective towards it and I keep it to where it's a walk on a bus, walk off the bus, you get all the data, I can give you a picture. Mm -hmm. That bus is communicating back with the hospital. The radiologist reading it. We're using lots of artificial intelligence software to dive into all that data and look for any things that may be going on in the human body that we may have looked over with our eyes. And then we're communicating back with you that same day. I'm going to give you a text message and say, hey, Joe, man, your scan looks great. You got some blockage in the coronary arteries. We're going to do this, that, and the other. And you're not waiting days for an answer. You're not left in, in this dark. dark about what's going on. Man, that's that's the health care I think I would want. Yeah. And as I'm aging, I'm I'm hoping that it, the <laughs> rest of it, what you yeah, get, right? yeah, that's fascinating. What's the cost of this to people? You said it's self-sustaining. I mean, I imagine yeah. that you're going into rural communities. You are so Medicare and, and the the government agencies that basically fund health care. 
know that it's so powerful. The data behind it has been the strongest screening test we can do. If you were to pick one screening test that has the best potential, it's this. is this. So that part was many years of discovery. The government saying, yeah, we need to do this. So if you have Medicare insurance, it's covered. Okay. Um, if you don't, the great thing is it's cash payment. The cost of doing this is $150. That's nothing. And if you don't have funds, so in a lot of these rural communities, we're dealing with people that truly are in hard times. And certainly, again, the last couple of years with the world and work issues, um, we don't want to stop health care just because somebody can't afford to do it. So the, the part of the donors and my job in getting support for this is we have funds to cover that expense so that anybody who's at risk isn't going to not engage in health care because of, because of a, cost. a fear or a cost or it's too long. It takes an hour, two hours. I don't have that much time. No, man, your, your sausage biscuit's not going to get cold. Jump on the scan. <laughs> you're going to be back drinking the coffee. And if you can give some order in the time yeah. that the biscuit comes yeah. out, right? <laughs> but if you can give somebody that choice, man, I think people will, people go for that. They will engage. If you tell them, come back next Tuesday, wait three hours in a reception area, spend half a day getting a scan you don't really want and make it financially difficult for them, well, all of us turn the other way. Yeah. Now, you said that there's a second bus in the works. Are yeah. you going to other hospitals and trying to promote this? What's your, is so, that catching on? Or? So what, what I love is taking that, again, my journey has been from aviation to biomedical electrical engineering to um, this field of thoracic surgery, which is heart and lung surgery and discovery of watching what my dad's generation did and other people and, and putting things together, learning from mistakes. What my view in, of this is everybody has a role to create in it. So what was unique about our region in, in East Tennessee is the rural nature of the population where the lung cancer was hiding and this, well, let's develop it. Well, nobody was working on it. So using great people in our community that are willing to get behind a project and testing it. I didn't know if it was going to work. Right, right. I knew we could build it, but was it really a good idea? Could it sustain itself? What we're at now, now that we've gone through the feasibility, we published on it, we've reported on it. Uh, people around the country now are going, hey, that's cool. And now you've tested it and you can give us data and yeah. and the economics of how to operate it and formula. And we can have a bus that they can buy i don't have any stake in it but then go copy exactly what we did right we've given them that roadmap. so we're on our second bus we're getting ready to build it and we keep looking for ways of making it better and we've got probably 15 programs that are now following our footsteps that live in you know, texarkana live in north carolina in uh, memphis covering arkansas mississippi to uh, middle and southern georgia where the same issues are there high prevalence of lung cancer, lack of imaging access, lack of hospitals, yeah. um, a population very vulnerable. I think everybody, certainly my age, goes, wow, what's a, what a concept. Let's actually make house calls. Let's go to the patients. Get out of this operating room every now and it's then. Get funny. out of our we, office. We're, uh, we're kind of going back to where we, uh, we yeah. started, right, with the doctor visits. I was actually, because um, I work in healthcare on the yeah. corporate side of it, um, and uh, we were like a Medicare Advantage company. We, we focused on like what we called value-based care. And we put together a whole solution or program called House Calls. And it was, we would take like a, a Medicare, Medicare Advantage population and the sickest two or 3% of patients, right? We would have like a team of doctors that could go to their house on 24-7 yeah. notice. And it was great, you know? People, people love that, benefit from it. I think it's... Something where there's a lot of issues with our health care system, but I think that's definitely one of them. Yeah, and if you try to go to the top, and which I did, and go to Washington and go, let's rewrite health care. Okay, that's, that's a complicated, long journey that's economically tied into so many things. What was that process like? You don't have to get into details, but <laughs> did you try to talk to congressmen? Or well, I, I tried to find the person who's been writing all the bills. <laughs> And oh, there's a guy in Boston uh, named Stuart Altman, and he's written a book on it. And it started back with, ironically, um, President Nixon, who wrote really the first version of the Affordable Care Act. So let's go figure. Republicans Did actually roll out under him, or was it Johnson? It, or it, I guess, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, it was in that. Uh, it was before Nixon, but it was the same kind of 
pro- I believe it was before Nixon, but the same kind of process of legislatively how we came out with this Medicare A and B and Medicaid was a convoluted legislative process that once it's in place, only Washington can manage. you can't change it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as I listened to him after eight hours of going, how did we get from there to here? And the difficulties of changing the direction of the whole healthcare system. Our country is so dependent on it as far as a percentage of GDP, the workforce, the jobs. It's above 20% of GDP now, right? Yeah. yeah. That if you change it too quickly, we'll throw our country in not a recession, but a depression. Mm-hmm. And so movements have to be really slow. So what I learned from all that was great you spent all this time in Washington and great I found out how who's writing the legislation and how we came to where we are today but the message was go back home and pick something that you make that small change in right. so what could I do what's lung cancer and what could I do for the people in our region changing the delivery system without having Washington rewrite a bill or changing the economics but use um, thought ingenuity teamwork uh, building something and part of it was a concept of taking the technology to the people, using modern data mining to, I don't need to go to everybody, but where are those pockets in our state and which counties are most at risk and how do I find those people and get to them first and start changing conceptually how we think about disease. We've talked about inflammation in the body. Instead of a lab value or me spitting out words they don't understand that are difficult to even spell, show them a picture. Show them visually what's going on and give them simple things that will help them stay healthier now we're in this population health model that you can incorporate nutrition. Maybe it is fasting. Maybe there is the reality of what we're all seeing. Maybe that's giving it. Giving them advice right there on the sure. spot. Like if you look and they've got, a, as you said, a whole bunch of junk in their arteries. or Yeah. Are you saying, hey, here's what you can do from a diet perspective or you need to exercise more? Yeah. Do you have so – like, is it something you're telling them or their pack, like takeaway yeah. packets you're so giving you, them? You, can't, you have to give people very exact things. So medication-wise, here's why you should take this medication that will help cut the inflammation down in the blood vessel. Like over-the-counter medication? These are prescription drugs. So, so we call them statin drugs. Yeah. They're – um, people think they lower the cholesterol, which they do, but they really cut the inflammation down in the blood vessels and will will significantly reduce your risk of having that heart attack, probably by 30%. But not everybody needs to be on one of them. So you can see who should and who shouldn't need to be on one. The diet piece is I go, all right, you're like me. You don't know where to go. You try something, you make no progress, you give up. Yeah. So I got to give them something. So I give them that five-day challenge. Again, it's a very specific Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you're going to do this. Well, most of us at my age or older can follow that. So there's no gray zone to it. And I go, you feel for yourself after doing it, how do you feel? And then then day six or seven, go back to what you're eating. And see how you feel. And I'm going to bet you, you have that eureka moment of crap. There is something to what I'm putting in my body. And I tell them, and they look at me like I've got a third out. I go, it's only five days. Remember what out the same person that told me the same thing. You can do this. Yeah. And most of them, if you can give them that straightforward of a plan, um, they want to get better. Uh, Americans don't want to die young. They don't want to be unhealthy yeah, and miserable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've just made the system so terrible. So the biggest thing from Stuart Altman, the guy in, in outside of Boston who said, Go back to your town, do what you know, and change your little piece of health care. Right. And for me, it was, let's take what we know about lung cancer, let's change the delivery model, let's go to the people, educate them, but make the system work electronically, get results quickly to them, give them pictures, educate them on not just whether they have lung cancer or not, but how can I keep you out of the hospital for the next year? What things are you genetically at risk for? Mm-hmm. Don't give them 20 things. It just it overwhelms somebody. How much of what you're seeing, like what, what's the biggest issue you typically see when you're seeing these scans? I imagine lung cancer, I think you hinted at this earlier, is fairly low prevalence. Is it heart disease? So the the number one finding as far as um, significance is coronary artery disease. And I'd say most of the scans will have some degree of disease. But you'll also be very surprised with somebody who looks like they're walking heart attack they're hard to look like an 18 year old. And that's just genetics. Yeah. And I look at them and say, why are you on all these medicines? And I go, well, look at me. Right. Everybody says I need to be on them. And I go, well, maybe you don't, you know, what we've never been able to see is what's, what does their heart really look like? Mm-hmm. Probably the second biggest thing is the impact of living life. What industry did we have in Tennessee? We had a lot of foundries. We had a lot of military and servicemen who've been from 
Um, we're, we're losing the last of World War II, but the Vietnam War exposed to Agent Orange, to all kinds of chemicals. Um, what did I do when I was growing up and I cut grass? I didn't wear a mask. All right, you'd come with your clothes filthy and dirty. We had a lot of the people in the foundries that, yeah, we have OSHA now, but I don't know they would have. They won't wear a mask unless you, you're made to wear the mask. Yeah. So our lungs have taken a big hit. And so you're seeing the shape that the lungs are in. And my point to them is we all will have a date with the flu, with the coronavirus, with something. So the better I can get your lungs in shape, the better chances you are to survive that encounter whenever it occurs. So I think heart disease and the general condition of the lungs, where they have emphysema, they've had chronic infection, scarring, those are probably the two biggest opportunities in anybody in Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. Do you think we've, um, we can tread carefully here, but underemphasized the importance of, or maybe overemphasized the importance of isolation, masking, and vaccines to the detriment of talking about exercise, vitamin D, general levels of health, especially like when we talk about something like COVID? I think the, the two issues, and, and I will say it's, it's very similar to other parts of medicine, of who are, we, who are we up against? So if it's a cancer cell, how unbelievably tiny it is. Virus to a virus is, is way smaller than a cancer cell. So that's part of where I think most of us, even in, in healthcare, can't get our arms around how tiny this this thing is. The other thing is is the messaging. I think as a healthcare system, we've not been great at messaging because one, no one person knew the answer. Um, there's a whole lot of disagreement that's typical in any nurse or discovery pathway, which way to go, what we think is right. And we're playing out this whole discovery process in real time publicly. Usually that's happening in the medical journals. It's happening outside of the public view. And when people make mistakes, they're not crucified for it. You learn from it. So that's what's made it, to me, the most difficult. Right. There's always, it's never a simple answer of a blood type, a vitamin D level. It's a holistic and, view of. And what's left when we look at lung cancer, we're making leaps and bounds. Our immune system, we never learned from the polio days why you might have gotten polio and I was right next to you and I got it, but I had no symptoms. Were you telling me uh, earlier that most people who were exposed to polio never showed any yeah. symptoms? So very, I just thought, I mean, I never really looked into it, but if you got polio, di- you were crippled. Different world from coronavirus, but still a, a, a very tiny organism. Is it bacteria? Or um, a virus? It's a virus. Um, but instead of getting into our mouth, I mean, to our respiratory system, our nose, it went through our GI tract. Okay. But in the early days, everybody was thinking it's the mouth, it's respiratory, it's caused by uh, somebody sneezing. What we really found out, it was predominantly acquired in swimming pools, that in really? the 50s, you didn't have chlorine in your swimming pools. And you had fecal contamination, not gross contamination, but people from just small amounts that contain that virus that kids were playing in it. Moms were taking their kids to the, the motel. Swallow some water on and it. You get some water in it, and that's how the virus was, was being spread. It was also predominantly a young person's disease. Right. Old Unlike people didn't get it. Yeah. The older people had developed some immunity through the years of being exposed to it and not knowing they ever were. And then you had this massive explosion of swimming pools and people going to it in the summertime that that exponentially rose the level of exposure to that virus but we stopped short of easier one to vaccinate and cure from a vaccination standpoint unlike a coronavirus is very difficult to cure from a vaccine standpoint from what we know today but what we stopped short of which i always thought was the big letdown is 90% 90% of the people had polio and didn't know they had it. 10% of the people developed some form of paralysis and 1% Why? died. Why? Right. It wasn't whether you're fat or skinny or blood type. There's something about... Did we ever figure that out? No, that we didn't. Them? And some of it, I don't know that we had the technology to do that. But it was but never n- even really asked. No, but now we do. And, and it's going to be... I, my guess is it's never as simple as we think. It has to do with how your, maybe your interferon or your body's initial response to an unknown agent of what genetic code you have and how you would respond to it. 
that turns on your body's immune system in certain cases that cause most of the destruction when the coronavirus is versus somebody else's who was a much more controlled response to it. But the bottom line is we have no idea. And I hope guys that are again, way smarter than I am that right. take what we can do today. Think of what we can do, cancer cells and DNAs. Surely we can take our immune system to the next level. And, and not just for this disease, but all the other diseases that we're constantly Fighting. randomly coming in contact with, that we come out of it with a, an amazing discovery of truly more about the human body and how we better prepare ourselves for this world we live in. The immune system's fascinating in that way too, right? Because if you, if it's a muscle, right, that it, I feel like it atrophies pretty quickly if you don't flex it. So in a way, well, if you if you if you believe uh, my father-in-law who's Mississippi, you need to eat dirt. Yeah, <laughs> you, you got you, you got to get outside. You need to be exposed to it, and that's part of developing your your to antibodies it. towards all this stuff. I, I don't know if he's right or wrong. Right. Certainly, there's it makes some sense at some level. Um, I just go back to I've been personally wrong in healthcare on things that I would have bet absolutely would have benefited. Yeah, one of them is is, is beating heart surgery. We always thought the bypass machine that was that amazing discovery. What if we could do surgery without even taking the blood out of the body? It had to be better. And every insight and in, in clinical trial we looked at suggested it would be better. And yet. 15 years later, we go, nah, it wasn't even better. In fact, what was causing most of the problems was the anesthesia gases, not the machine. But it's we got. You, uh, yeah. it is, right? And I think we're going to go down this same pathway. We've had the public debate, and people have gotten to. Coronavirus. Yeah. And, and they've, they've missed the bigger point. We don't know. And it's so tiny. I mean, 0.1 microns to 0.5 microns. I can't even get in my mind about how tiny this thing is. But what I do have confidence in is our scientific world that when left to truly fail, to truly dive into the discovery process, and I hope we come out of it better than we did with polio of not only how do we get back to life, but also how do we, how do we fend off whatever the next yeah. do you think, virus or... Do you or, think it's probably uh, here to stay? Do you think it's yeah. endemic to the population at this point? For now. For now. I say for now because probably the... The misleading message, and, and I bought into it also, of get the vaccine, is gone. Like polio, like smallpox, except coronavirus is different. Well, those, and I could be wrong here, but there weren't active pandemics of smallpox or polio, too, when the vaccines started being administered, right? But, but yeah, but totally different. Type of virus. Yeah, the, the mutation rate, how quickly it's changing. And, the you know, polio, we really had to deal with three, three strands. strands of it. Right, because if it was and, still coronavirus alpha, yeah, the the vaccine was yeah. pretty effective. And, and there's no doubt for somebody like me, the vaccine saved lives with yeah. worth doing. But it, it's a short term to where we got to get to, which is let the scientists fail. Don't crucify them for it. Let it go, let's go through this period of discovery. It'll take us many years, and we may be able someday to truly say we can get rid of all coronaviruses, or maybe right. we this sort of um melts into just more another type of a virus that you can get that's not as deadly as it started out to be but i don't know that we know that direction mm -hmm. i just think we've got to let the scientists be scientists and part of that is failing mm -hmm. of going down a pathway of discovery that i have in my journey and going man i would have swore that but not only did i realize i was wrong but here's what my flaw in my logic and thinking was which makes me a better scientist and helps me get to Look where we are with lung cancer. There's a lot of failures and misbeliefs and thought processes that is taking us to where we are today. Yeah. We got to let that process play out, and it's hard when it's hard when the politics gets yeah. involved and, yeah. and and as a country and it's trying to everybody we, wants things to be better. We want it. We're used to the to the Chick Fil A that man works great. I'm even though there's a long line, I'm getting my food quickly. Right. I want a quick solution to this. I want to get on. I got a concert in two weeks that I want to still happen. I want to go on this trip. So, so we've been spoiled in life. And, mm -hmm. and I think probably my biggest message to everybody, okay, take a deep breath. This is a longer journey than we like, but we've already learned a lot. Yeah. And, and, and let's let the scientists do what they do and try to, yeah. try to create that optimal field for discovery and, yeah. and figure That's out the, the immune system. That's the whole point of science, right, yeah. is to 
<laughs> come up with a hypothesis, yeah. have everybody beat it down until if somebody, right? Yeah, so I go back it's to... It's correct for now. So what is the biggest reasons. thing that Jim Allison did? I go back to discovery of the immune system and fighting cancer. Um, Woody Harrelson narrates this documentary, so it's a great thing. Jim Allison, the breakthrough, is going, these guys that were brilliant scientists got something wrong. And this guy from Texas going, you dummies, you forgot to do this. Right. And then correcting the science and literature and then taking it to that next level where people were about ready to give up on the immune system. Man, if we didn't allow that to play out, if we treated that like we were treating coronavirus, it never would have happened. It kind of reminds me, this is a little bit of an anecdotal story, but um, do you remember all the talk? I think this might have been before my time, but I've read about it, about Planet X. No. So this was this is a, a, a great story and how people can get set in their ways, but <clears throat> scientists were looking at the orbit of, I think it was Neptune or Uranus, and... The way the orbit was, they figured there had to be some hidden planet that we couldn't see that was impacting the orbit. And for years, these scientists were looking for Planet X. They just couldn't find it. Well, it turns out that the tools that they were measuring the orbit with and the gravitational pull were incorrect. And kind of like that guy you were saying, he went, hey, you guys, they, somebody said you guys calibrated these measuring tools wrong. Yeah. When they did that, <clears throat> boom, now all the math made sense. There was no missing planet. Yeah. Anyway, it's we're you know we're we're doing the scientific world. We're doing our country, human beings, the world a disservice if we don't allow that process to play out. Yeah. And you know, it's it's hard when everything is live cameras. Everything's constantly on, and everybody's looking for that gotcha yeah. moment. Yeah. You know, I I I just cheer for the failures as much as the success because that's how we get to the end point and i have no doubt we'll get to that point i mean what i've seen in my lifetime i couldn't have even dreamed we'd be in this situation for diseases like lung cancer and breast cancer and the technology and being able to truly look at a cell i can't even see with even a high-powered microscope and understand the proteins within it that are making it live and breathe and holy cow we we got this Dr. Hedrick, this has been an awesome conversation. I, I really appreciate it. It's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Happy to share my, my, my life with you. <laughs> the craziness of it all.